he won two Emmy Awards for his portrayal of meathead Mike Stivic on All in the Family, and then went on to direct some of the biggest movies of the 1980s and 90s. Stand By Me, The Princess Bride, When Harry Met Sally, A Few Good Men, and Misery. He was born into showbiz royalty. His father, Carl Reiner, created the landmark TV sitcom The Dick Van Dyke Show. And just like his father, he shows no signs of slowing down, with recent films that include The Bucket List and Flipped. Outside of show business, he's a husband, a father, and a political activist. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with director, producer, and Emmy Award-winning actor, Rob Reiner. find that all good art or quality art is truly personal at some level? I think so. I mean, you know, obviously films are a very collaborative medium, so uh, there are a lot of, you know, influences. But yes, I think, you know, when you're looking at uh, any kind of writing or painting, uh, it's always an expression of the artist. And you can only paint or write or, you know, uh, what you know. Uh, and something that's an extension of who you are, even if it's uh, fantastical and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, magical and all that, it still comes out of you and, and, and your sensibility. When it starts for you, is it when you read the story, you recognize something that touches you specifically, or in making it, do you bring it to that point? No, I have to, I, when I read uh, something, whether it's a book or play or just an idea I have, it has to be something that I can connect with. I, I can't, I wouldn't know how to tell the actors what to do unless it was something that I've experienced in some manner. And in, in Flipped, uh, it's about uh, first love and, and the feelings that you have when you have those first very powerful, confusing feelings of love. And these are obviously things that I've gone through and, and I went through them at 12 going on 13, which is when the characters in the film uh, you know, are that age. And so, yeah, I have to connect with it in some way. Otherwise, I don't, wouldn't know how to tell the story. It's funny, in, in doing the research for you, one of the things that I read was that they described you as a director who tells love stories. And I'd never thought of you that way till I read that. Is that how you see yourself? Well, I don't know about that. I've, I certainly have told a lot of love stories. I mean, whether it's The Sure Thing or When Harry Met Sally or even uh, The American President, oddly enough, Misery is a, yeah. a twisted kind of, of love story. But, uh, you know, and Princess Bride, certainly. Uh, I guess so. I mean, you know, I mean, when you look at all the great songs, they're all about love in some way. I mean, though, love and life, those are the things that we, we know about and we can, you know, write poetically about in some way. So I guess... Yes, in, in some manner. I mean, I wouldn't call uh, Spinal Tap necessarily a love story. Uh, uh, it's a love-hate story and a, a confused love story. But, uh, uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, take me back. When it all started for you, what was it you wanted to do in this business? Where did you begin? Well, I, I did want to direct. I always wanted to direct. Uh, you know, I watched my dad growing up, and uh, I admired him so much. Uh, he... Uh, I looked up to him. He was like a god to me. And I, he, he tells this story. When I was eight years old, uh, I came up to him and I, I said, Dad, I want to change my name. And he thought, oh, my God, this poor kid, you know, he, he's the, the burden of having to be Carl Reiner's son. And, I, and he said, what do you want to change your name to? And I said, Carl. <laughs> and so, you know, basically I wanted to be him. So yeah. I've always wanted to do that. And uh, even when I was young, as, uh, although I started out as an actor, I always wanted to direct. There's a very small exclusive group of those of you that came from extremely successful parents in this business and then went on to be very successful yourselves. Why do you think that is? I think if you have a father or a mother who is... Uh, really successful on, on a very visible level, it's very hard to live up to. I mean, I've had this conversation with Michael Douglas. I mean, when, when we made uh, American President, and even before that, we were basically in a club of, you know, three or four. There's not many. I mean, you know, you look at Jane Fonda, who was Henry Fonda's daughter, and maybe Liza Minnelli, who was, 
Judy Garland's daughter. Uh, there aren't many, you know, there are certainly uh, fathers and sons, I mean, the Bridges, can, you know, but, but f parents who's, who achieved at a very, very high level, like Kirk Douglas or my dad in television and certainly in, you know, directing movies, uh, it's very hard to live up to. And, uh, you know, it, you can count them on one hand. Yeah. Why do you think you're drawn then to stay in that business as opposed to saying, I can be me over here? You know, it's just that it's it's something in you that you want to do. Uh, like I say, I, I love my dad. I looked uh, up to him so much, uh, and I still love him. And he he is a guiding uh, influence, and I can hear him. As, as we're talking, I hear his voice uh, coming out of me. Um, it, it's just something that's in you, you know. I, I think that, you know, I have a sister and a brother who are neither or who are in show business, uh, but uh, for me it was something uh, that drove me. Yeah. When you went off to do All in the Family, at that point was it rebellion in some way? The character, the show, to what your father had done? How did you... Well, balance? All in the Family to me was like a, an extraordinary opportunity to act in uh, material that had never before been seen on television. Uh, that was the, the driving uh, desire for me. I mean, we thought that show was never going to go. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's way too edgy and hip for the room and all of that, and it'll be on for 13 weeks, it'll, it'll be off. But just the idea of being on something where the writing was of that quality, and also the character was very similar to my, uh, you know, my personality and my political views at the time. Certainly I was, you know... A, crazy liberal at the time. I'm, I'm a little more, more subdued, <laughs> moderate liberal now. As we get older, we, we, uh, the edges get cut off a little bit. But um, no, I, was, I, I related to that character. It was not any kind of rejection of my father or anything. It was just, ooh, a, good, uh, a real chance to do something great. Yeah. How soon, how early on in that process did you realize you were in something important? Well, we knew it was something important when we first started, even before it went on the air. Like I said, we didn't think it was going to be successful, but we knew it was special. We knew this writing and the uh, subject matter was way beyond anything that had been done on television. But we knew when we were successful and the audience was accepting it was the second 13 weeks. The first 13 went on, and then they reran that 13 over the summer, the same episodes, and that's when the audience... Uh, uh, latched onto it, and then we knew because we'd go out in public and people would go crazy. I remember one time going into an airport with Sally Struthers and Gene Stapleton. We walked into a, uh, there was a you know restaurant area in the airport, and people stood up and started cheering. And so I said, <laughs> I think we're on to something here. We could be a hit. Yeah, you you talk all the time about Meathead. You'll always be referred to as Meathead. I almost think that maybe that time has passed now. I think that there's a lot of this generation that has no idea who you were besides the director of these great films. Well, that may be true. I do get meat-headed uh, almost on a daily basis, though, still. And I, I used to make the joke all the time that no matter what I do, if I, even if I win the Nobel Prize, it'll say, Meathead wins Nobel. Uh, but I, you might be right. I mean, uh, certainly the younger kids... Uh, don't know it as much, although it does play on TV land and Nick at Night and all of that, and so younger generations do pick up on the show, but I don't look anything like I do. <laughs> My daughter, who's 12 years old, has n not seen the show, has never seen All in the Family. Before we leave too much of the TV era, I want to know a little about the Smothers Brothers, working well, in the that the Smothers Brothers was the greatest uh, opportunity for me. I was 21 years old, and all of a sudden I'm working uh, on a network television show that's the most cutting-edge variety show that had ever been on television. Steve Martin and I were, were uh, writing partners. We were teamed up because we were the youngest guys. And it was, you know, it was like a anarchy, free-for-all. I mean, there was the, all these crazy young hippies on the writing staff, you know, coming up with these outrageous ideas to push the edge. We weren't pushing the edge of the envelope. We were destroying the entire envelope. I mean, there was no, <laughs> there was no, there was nothing to send a, a letter in after we got finished with it. And Tom Smothers, who I, to this day, have such great admiration for, because he was really fighting the powers that be. We were young kids figuring, you know, we could do anything, and we were always, come on, Tommy, you can do more. We were always, you know, arguing with him that he was, you know, copping out. Now I realize that he was like uh, 
uh, you know, he was right out there on the edge and, and doing amazing stuff. But it was an amazing time. I mean, you had the 60s. We had the Vietnam War going on. There was the Civil Rights Movement. There was the Women's Movement. And we, you know, we uh, uh, expressed uh, those, those ideas all throughout the show. Is there a point where you soften into telling stories? Somebody who's come out of Smothers Brothers and then All in the Family, they've become these family films. What happens in you, or are you still addressing the same issues? Do you what think? happens is when you're young, and I think this is good for young people, uh, you thumb your nose at society. You're trying to find your way, so you're, uh, you're making fun of, you're satirizing things, you're rejecting things, you're saying, this is stupid, this is stupid. And, you know, I did uh, satire when I did the committee, when I did Spinal Tap, when I... Uh, worked on the Smothers Brothers. We, you know, it's about being anti-establishment. As you get older, it's about finding things that you're in favor of and not things you're against, and finding out what it is you believe in, what it is, what are the things you care about, and so that's uh, and when you have get married and have children, those things start shifting, and then you want to tell stories that uh, embrace the ideas that you care about. And so that's how I make that transition. It doesn't mean I still don't have that critical, satirical bone in my body. I do. But more often than not, I, I tend to go towards things that are uh, character pieces, emotional pieces, and things that uh, you know, pe hopefully people can relate to. Leaving all in the family, hard, difficult, the right thing at the right time, how do you see it? It, it was hard leaving all in the family. Not, it, I didn't think it was going to be hard, but it was hard for me because I did want to direct, and in those days, uh, people who were in television were like second-class citizens. There were movie people and TV people. Now you find this uh, back and forth transition, you know, they're making movies out of TV shows and people make that transition easily. I mean, there was, uh, you know, Gary Marshall and Penny Marshall and Jim Brooks and Danny DeVito and Ron Howard, all people who came from television and made movies. But at the time when I wanted to make movies, there was nobody from television that was making movies. And so you're pigeonholed. And it took me a long time to be accepted uh, as somebody other than a sitcom character and it took me like four years to get Spinal Tap off the ground but then once I got moving it was, it was okay. Something that I wonder about and am interested in figuring out you go from a showbiz family which most people would say isn't the common American experience then you have success on television you win your Emmys all of this not the common experience then you get into telling stories and you tap right into the American experience in such a way that you have hit after hit after hit. What is it in you that allowed you to understand the psyche of a nation? Well, you know, it's interesting, but I look at my dad, and even though uh, the Dick Van Dyke show was about a guy who wrote for uh, a variety show, you know, a, a comedian on television, the, 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 the heart of that show and what was great about that show is that it was human. It was about any marriage. It could have been any marriage in the suburbs uh, with a family. And so he drew on his own experiences of what it was like to be married and have children and all of that. And that's what I took from him to learn to, to do that. Uh, it doesn't matter that you're coming from a show business background. You still have those feelings and desires and wanting to make relationships with women and wanting to be a good parent and all of those things. So that's what I drew on. And, it, you know, to me, it's not about being in show business. It's about being a person on the planet and, and uh, trying to express those But I those think you'd have to admit that there are people in showbiz who don't seem to be that connected to that side anymore, that the lifestyle can remove you from the everyday experience. Yeah, I, I think it can. And also I think the... The, uh, the influences of the studios to wanting to make uh, pictures that are about hardware, about uh, CGI and about explosions and so on, which is about taking the technical uh, aspects of the media and experimenting and doing all kinds of things. And there are great guys, guys who do that well. I mean, uh, Jim Cameron with Avatar and those things. Uh, so there is some, you know, Bob Zemeckis does those kinds of things. 
uh, people who want to, you know, explore the technology, the media, and, and figure out that. I've come from an old school of wanting to tell just human stories, and less and less there are places for those things, and hopefully with Flip there will be a place. I mean, make a with Bucket List there was a place. We found an audience for people, you know, who wanted to see a story about two guys wrestling with their lives and trying to get the most out of their life. Uh, and hopefully they'll, they'll relate to this as well. And I think there still is an audience for people who want to see human films. You make a joke about in Flip that there's a scene where the girl jumps off her bicycle, and for you, that's an action sequence. Yes, yeah, there's a scene when she comes back from this scene where the, the, the boy tries to kiss her, and she runs away. She's mortified, and she races home with her bike, and she jumps off her bike and runs in the house, and the bike lands in front of the camera. And to me, that, that is, that's, that's as far as I go with an action scene. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back a little bit now, back to Stand By Me. People always talk about, you know, what an amazing cast that was at the, in that film and how they've all amounted to so much. And I have to wonder, what comes first in a situation like that? Is it your eye at discovering fresh young talent? Is it something in the process of making a film with you that lifts them to the next level? It's not just by chance that the stars of that film go on to be the stars of today. What do you think it is in the process that, that helps well, them? Well, I think that the first thing is you have to have a great script. I mean, if you have a a, a story and a, and a great script, and in that case, it was St it was a Stephen King story uh, with great characters that can lift uh, any actor. I mean, any any actor will tell you that uh, you're only as good as the, the material you get to uh, to say. And so, if you find good actors who are then lifted by the material, and hopefully. Uh, the director who doesn't get in the way of good material and allows the actors to do what they do, then they can go on. And, you know, you've got to have an eye for who can do it. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, to me, River Phoenix was, uh, you know, brilliant in that film. And I think, unfortunately, had he not, you know, met with a terrible tragedy, he would have, he would have gone on to be one of the great, uh, you know, actors in America. So, uh, but you find, you know, find people. I mean, Maddie, Maddie, uh, 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 in our film, you know, Madeline Carroll, she's a brilliant actress, you know, but she, if she doesn't get a chance to do material that can show off her talents and, and lift her, then, you know, she, you don't know what could happen to her. But I think this kind of film is going to springboard her into, you know, all kinds of things. She's an, a brilliant, brilliant actress. You talk a lot about that, about how, how good she is, the quality of what she does. How do you see that, and then as a director with someone so young, how do you know when to step out of the way and let her create, and how much do you help mold? Well, in the case of, of Maddie Carroll, she is uh, one of the most gifted actors I've ever worked with, and I've worked with some great actors, you know, Nicholson and Morgan Freeman and, and, and Tom Cruise and so on. Uh, she has as uh, developed a facility and craft as any actor I've ever worked with. Her instincts are almost like a studio musician who has perfect pitch. I mean, she hits all the notes perfectly. You don't have to do very much with her in order to get her to do what she needs to do. She has this incredibly uh, well-developed instrument. So with her, I didn't, you know, the only scene she had trouble with was the kissing scene. You know, she, she got very nervous, and every time they went to go to kiss each other, she started to laugh and ran away, yeah. So, which is what she's supposed to, She's not supposed to laugh and run away. She's supposed to run away in the, in, the, in the scene, which she does, but that was the only thing that was hard for her. But everything else, she's absolutely brilliant, and you'll see when you see the film. And How do you create the atmosphere on the set to allow people to be creative? It's such a, a delicate, sensitive area, yeah, and so often you see directors who are yelling and, and demanding and all that. What do you do on a set to make sure you're going to get the best from each person you work with? Well, I try to create a very nice atmosphere, a relaxed atmosphere that allow. It's like, you know, so the kids can play in the sandbox. You don't want bullies. You don't want people uh, pushing people around. You want to provide a play area where everybody can feel comfortable to play, and that's what I, I, I try to do. I say uh, to people that you will remember the experience you have making a film long after you'll remember the film. I mean, the actors will. The audience remembers the film because that's what they see. Right. But the people making the film have the experience, and I want that experience to be good for everybody because you wake up in the morning and you come to work, and this is the time on the planet for you. You know, you're experiencing your time 
you know, in the process. So you want that to be good. You want to be able to come to work and say, hey, that guy's here today. Hey, isn't that, oh, I get to see him today. And so that's what I try to create an atmosphere where everybody can in, relax and enjoy themselves. I also read somewhere that you like to keep work is work and home is home. And when you're at work, you're working. And when you're at home, you're living your life. Yeah, I, I try to do that. And I think I've been pretty successful with that. Uh, I don't work, try to work long hours. I mean, the most I'll ever work is a 10-hour day. Most of the time, it's not even that long. And I want to give the, the crew and the cast time to finish their work and go home and be with their families. Because to me, it makes the work better. You know, the work becomes better if you have time, and I want to have time with my family. So when you finish your work, you go home and enjoy your family, because that's, you know, it, it was, I, I remember something years ago, John Wooden, who just passed away, uh, was a great coach for UCLA Bruins, and he said, when you uh, play the game, uh, play your hardest, and if you win, feel in the locker room, feel great about the win. If you lose, you can feel bad about the loss. But the, when you leave the locker room, that game is done. Now you're with your friends, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your you know, kids. And now it's time to be with them. You know, there's no more basketball now. And I've, I've always thought that that was the right thing. Yeah. Looking back at your body of work, are there films that surprise you that were hits and films that surprised you that weren't? And what would those be? Well, the, the film that surprised me that was a hit was Stand By Me because really? it was a film with four uh, unknown, you know, 13-year-old boys, 12, 13-year-old boys, and uh, I was surprised that it was as successful as it was. Uh, the film that, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, you never know what films are going to be a hit and what's not going to be a hit. I think The American President, which was I think, one of the best films I've made, uh, I thought it would do better than it. I mean, it was successful, and it did, you know, it made money and did well, but I thought it would do better, and then in hindsight, I realized it's a liberal point of view. I mean, there's no question about it, and I think a lot of people who are conservative just said, hey, I don't believe in gun control and, you know, those environmental controls and all of those things, so I think we probably cut off part of the audience by doing that in hindsight. But I wouldn't have made it any differently, so. So, true or false, you were considering a run for governor? You know, I considered it for a minute. <laughs> How uh, was that minute? <laughs> well, the, I, I considered it for a minute, and then I sat down with my family, and uh, I polled 40% in my own. I basically <laughs> couldn't carry my, my own family. And I realized if I couldn't carry my own family, I probably shouldn't run. Yeah. What was the excitement, the thrill of being involved, do you think, in that process? Well, at that time, I had just passed... Uh, an initiative in California. We raised cigarette taxes 50 cents a pack and it funded early childhood development. And I chaired a state commission for seven years, uh, which was a program at the time of about $600 million a year for child care and health care and preschool programs for children. And it, it was a desire, and I still have the desire, to make a difference, to try to impact people uh, in a way that uh, can be meaningful and can have some lasting effect, uh, you know, in the fabric of society. And I still do that now. I'm right now I'm involved in uh, challenging Proposition 8 in California, which uh, banned uh, uh, gay marriage uh, against the California Supreme Court's uh, uh, decision to allow it to be legal. They passed a, a law changing the California Constitution, and we filed a suit in federal court to uh, basically say that that law in California runs afoul of the U.S. Constitution. And we've started the process. We had our first leg of the trial in San Francisco in the district court. We're waiting for the judge's ruling now. It'll hopefully it'll go on to the, uh, the uh, circuit court and then the Supreme Court. And so it's, to me, the last piece of the civil rights puzzle will allow uh, all the one segment of the population that is not uh, thought of as equal to everybody else and will allow gays to get married. So, you know, it's maybe not the most popular thing, but I look at it as, you know, everybody has a right to be equal in our society. And what's interesting is we have the two lawyers who faced each other in Bush v. Gore, Ted Olson, who was George Bush's lawyer, and David Boyce, who was Al Gore's lawyer, are teamed up. We, we, we raised the money to team the two of them up, and they are fighting together for these rights. So even though you have a very conservative Republican and a liberal Democrat, they both believe that everyone in America should have equal rights. Yeah. I heard that you're not real good at multitasking. So when you're involved in a political uh, venture, 
film will take a back seat and vice versa. It's true. It's true. I'm not very good at uh, doing two things. Li when I do something, I like to focus uh, like a laser on the thing that I'm doing. And so when I was uh, chairing the state commission during that seven years, I only made two films. And uh, I didn't focus as well as I might have on those films. Uh, and so now I'm back into really uh, focusing on my film work. And I did Bucket List and now flipped and, uh, you know, keeping myself focused more on filmmaking, which is... It's a lot more fun and, and, and it's very satisfying. But when I hear you talk about the political work too, I get the feeling that it's really, it doesn't matter if you're working in the political arena or if you're working in the film arena, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to educate an audience or help them through an issue or a situation, understand things. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying ultimately to have some kind of an impact. You know, whether I impact an audience to move them and make them laugh or cry or think about something or impact society in some way where we can actually try to make a difference. So, yes, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, express myself in some way to, to impact the audience. If you couldn't make films, what would you do? Well, I'd probably do something in the, you know, in the, the political arena, ne not necessarily as an elected official, but certainly in trying to uh, move the ball forward, whether it's with health care, edu education, those issues that I care about, or the environment. And last question before we wrap up. Bonnie Meadow Lane, Bonnie Meadow Road. Yes. A little yes. history Bonnie on Meadow, that. Bonnie Meadow Road is where I lived when I was, when, when I was a kid in New Rochelle. We lived at 48 Bonnie Meadow Road. And uh, when my father did the Dick Van Dyke show, he had the Petries, Rob and Laura Petrie, lived at 148 Bonnie Meadow Road. And now when flipped, it's Bonnie Meadow Lane. So I try to keep that... A moment of my childhood alive in uh, Bonnie Meadow. Well, thank you for keeping the moments of all of our childhoods alive with your films, with your stories. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a great interview. We're very, very, you made it very painless. <laughs> Rob Reiner. Thank you. To order a DVD of this or any episode of Interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.